But part of the preparation is learning to win the victory and to understand the purpose of the trial right where we are today. We gain experience with God, not on the mountaintop, but quite often in the valley. On the mountaintop, we, we don't necessarily, we rejoice in God, but we don't necessarily need his strength as much as we do when we're down in the valley. When we're pressed on all sides, like Paul the Apostle said elsewhere in the scriptures in Asia, he said we were, we were pressed above strength so that we even despaired of life. The, the battle was, was so difficult that we didn't think we could survive it. So he says we had the sense of death in ourselves and we, we put away trusting in ourselves and we trusted in the one who lives inside of us who has raised us from the dead and given us life and promised to keep us and promised to sustain us. You know, sometimes my brothers, my sisters, we can find ourselves living in a generation where people are not going to read their Bibles and they're not necessarily going to listen initially to what you have to say. God in his mercy for their sakes, not necessarily for ours, but for their sakes, God in his mercy will let us be put into a place where they will see a strength in us that they don't have. They will see in us an ability to go through trials that they know they could not endure in themselves. So that Christ who lives inside of us, as the Bible says, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, might become known. Now, where there's, there's certain times, there are, there are seasons where the gospel can be preached audibly and ought to be in all seasons for sure. But there are certain times where people are not open to listen but they will see Christ in you when you have to go. And I have to go through circumstances that they have no inner strength to go through. And they come to the realization that there's a divine enablement inside of your life. So it's so important to win those personal victories. Now, those personal trials, struggles that you know that you're in, they're not public, but you know that you're in this trial. First Peter chapter one, beginning at verse three, Peter says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away and reserved in heaven for you. In other words, in the end, we win. We have a victory. We have a place in heaven. We have an eternity with God and who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire might be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you on their part. He is blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. You know, there's sometimes in society, some, as I said earlier, are experiencing it today in other parts of the world. We have biblical examples of times when it just seems the trials that believers in Christ are called to endure seem to be all pervasive. They seem to be everywhere. There are, there are times that Maybe you and I will have to collectively go through the valley of the shadow of death. We'll have to go through difficult periods till that day. If it should come, I don't pray that it does, but there's no guarantee that it won't come till that day. May we be strengthened 
by Christ in the inner man by learning how faithful he is to keep us in every trial that we face today. That's what Peter was trying to teach the people of his generation. Learn to find the victory where you are so that when the greater trial comes, you will have an increased confidence in God. That the God who has kept you in the past will keep you today and will keep you tomorrow. That you have so sown in your heart those words of Jesus Christ, I will never leave you or forsake you. Elsewhere, he said, in this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. Christ in me is my strength. Christ in you is your strength. He is our light. He is our hope. He's our strength. He's our song. He's our future. He's our present. He is everything that we will ever need is in Christ who lives inside of us. An example of this, when it became an all pervasive difficulty for the people of God is found in Daniel chapter three. When a king got it in his head to raise up an image of man and told the whole society, you are going to have to bow down to this image. When we play our instruments, when we shout, and when we have our parties, when we do our celebrations, you will celebrate with us. You will bend and you will bow to our image of what man and mankind and society should look like. And if you will not bend or bow to that image we set before you, we're going to make it hot for you. You're going to go into the fire. We're going to bankrupt you. We're going to ruin you. We're going to charge you. We're even going to jail you. And in the case of Daniel, we're going to throw you into a burning, fiery furnace. Three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had suffered, but they had known in their suffering the keeping power of God, had determined in their hearts that they were only going to serve the living God and they were not going to bend nor bow to what they knew to be an abomination. This was a lie and they were unwilling to bend or bow before this lie. And so when the music began to play, they refused to bow. When they were brought before the king and threatened, they refused to bend. They believed that God was able to keep them and they told the king, and even if he doesn't, we're not bending, we're not bowing before the image that you have set before us. And it was this determination to go through trial, to go into the fire as it was. They were thrown in a burning fiery furnace and the king coming up and looking inside the door, expecting to see nothing but rags and ashes. That furnace was so hot, it killed the people that threw them in. And looking inside of that furnace, he said, did we not throw three men into the fire? But I see four and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. The form of the fourth is like something that we don't, we've never seen before. It's like something that can only, it's a created being that can only come from the heavens. That's what he was saying. This is not what I'm looking at is divine. And he saw this presence of God because three young men decided to go into trial and they would not bend their knee to ungodliness. They would not bend their knee to an alternate view of what society should look like. The eradication of God and the elevation of men, maybe we call it that. And when they went into the trial, because they were kept in the midst of the fire, this ungodly king saw the presence of God. Do you understand? Sometimes it's only when we go into the fire that those who are ungodly around us are able to see the presence of God in our lives. The one who walks with us through trial, the one who keeps us where nobody else could. The one who preserves us when we should be perishing because of the circumstance around us. Then again in Daniel chapter 6, an ungodly leader of a country, a society, got it into his head that he is God. He should be God for 30 days. When, when people push God out of their society, there's no end to the stupidity that can get a hold of them. And so he got it in his head that nobody should pray to anybody but me for 30 days. And if it, just to make sure they don't, if anybody does, they're going to be thrown into a den of lions and eaten by the lions. And Daniel, of course, who had walked with God for years and he knew the power of God and the presence of God. He knew the real God. He refused and he went into his room. And as his custom was three times a day, opened his window towards Jerusalem. He had a promise of revival in his heart and he would not yield it in spite of any threat that came his way. 
And so he was taken and accused and he was thrown into the den of lions. Now this time the king didn't see what happened. It was only the testimony of Daniel when he came to that pit where he was thrown in. He says, Daniel, has your God been able to preserve you? And Daniel says, long live the king. God has sent his servants and he has shut the mouths of the lions. Now he didn't see it this time, but he heard the testimony from a man of God. The people around you will not always see the presence of God, but they will hear your testimony that God has been faithful to me. He sent a word to me and what should have devoured me had no power over me. Yes, the devil, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But God sent his word to me and God gave me an inner confidence and shut the mouths of the lions. And I am still here. Praise be to God. And in both cases, laws were changed because people in authority saw a deliverance from God that only God himself could give. And here's my point. If they had not gone into the trial, the kings would never have seen it. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.